I hope you can decide to here. I am praying that our soul today. Let's begin with this song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Everyone standing with me as we sing. Join in. <laughs> Good singing. Thank you, Terry. Appreciate that. If you're ready to worship today, say amen. 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 The Bible says in the book of Acts, they were all in one accord. And I've parked a Honda right out here. So if all of you will go get in it. No, that means all of us agreeing and uniting. If we're all together, God's going to bless us. He's going to answer our request. Good to see my mother here today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's going, what did I do? What did I do? <laughs> oh. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, we thank you for the rain you give us, the sunshine, the breath in our lungs. Lord, the health. We thank you for everything you give to us. And Lord, today we're still begging like children to, give you, to ask you to pour out your blessings anew on us today. God, enrich our hearts and nurture our souls. And Lord, just fill us with your fire and we'll appreciate it so much. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good to see this good choir up here today. And also good to see visitors we have with us. No, I'm not going to come embarrass anybody. I had to come over and get this bag. And so first thing we want to do today is have Terry come up here. Terry, come on up here. We know Terry and Judy are going to the beach this week. You get away from us. And <laughs> so... And, Oh boy. <laughs> Sometimes we need a break, don't we? <laughs> now they're going down there and, and uh, he's going to get ready for the message I'm preaching next week on heaven. And with Judy, the angel, you ought to be in good stead. But we appreciate what Terry does around here. And we got him a bass cleft. He's the biggest, tallest guy we got in our church. And he sings like a girl. He sings way up. Here. So we got him a bass cleft. Norma, if you'll come around, where's Norma? You got your camera? Not really? All right, okay. We'll, we'll get it later. Nate, and then we'll, uh, and then we got him a t-shirt. I ordered this the other day for him. He plays the saxophone. And it says on his shirt, some grandpas play bingo, real grandpas play saxophone. Yeah. See that? Yeah, yeah, see that? All right. Appreciate you, Terry. Yeah. Give, it, give him another round of applause, right? Not too loud, he's liable to come back. 
All right, now, remember a couple of announcements. One is that the security team in the parking lot ministry will meet on the 19th at 6 p.m. If you'd like to be part of that or come and find out what they're doing, that's on the 19th at 6 p.m. Also, remember the big announcement is our upcoming revival, which starts May 16th. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand how many of you have already cleared your calendar for May 16th to 19th, because I know it'd be everybody. But clear your calendar. This morning you'll find an interesting article on Jason Mullinax, who will be preaching that opening sermon on the, uh, on the uh, 16th. And also in the bulletin it says that that first service is at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. But it's not. It's at 11 o'clock. We just accidentally left a 1 off right there. So check it. No, no, that's later. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we, she and I talked about doing something and that's later. All right. Okay. I'm 70. She's young, but we both forget sometimes. All right. All right, Brother Terry, come and give us some more music. Let's continue to lift our voices in song. Everyone standing. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Everyone singing along with me now. what he's done for us. Yeah. And I love this song, my tribute, because how can I say thanks yeah. for all the things that the Lord has done for me? You know, we ought to be yelling hallelujah from the hilltops and just all over Henderson County for all that God has done for us. You just join in with me and lift those voices and let's sing to the Lord this morning.
Frustration gets so out of hand But it's then I am reminded I've never been forsaken I've never had to stand one test alone As I look at all the victories The Spirit rises up in me It's through the fire my weakness is made strong never promised that the cross would not get heavy and the hill would not be hard to climb. He never offered our victories without fighting, but he said hell would always come in time. So remember when you're standing in the valley of and the adversary says give in just hold on our Lord will show up and he will take you to the fire I know within myself that I would surely perish but if I trust the mighty hand of God you shield the flames again. again, again. He never promised that the cross would not get heavy and that you would not be hard to climb. He never offered our victories without fighting, but he said help would always come. So remember when you're standing in the valley of decision and the adversary says give in, just hold on. Our Lord will show up and he will take you through the fire again. And he will take you through the fire again. Let's all stand for our doxology this morning, everyone raising their voices to the Lord. Here we go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 
praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, this morning during the offering, if you'd like to bring your tithes and offerings up here, you're welcome to <coughs> place them on the communion table. Or there's baskets out in the hallway. You can put there your offering there. And uh, we'll do that as Margaret's playing something beautiful up for us today. But so good to see you. Uh, we'll be seated right after the prayer. But preacher buddy, would you pray for us? Okay, what I said was, what I said, right, let, me, let me tell you a quick story before we pray. Uh, I mean, you know, some of y'all know evangelist Billy Kelly. He's dead and gone now, but a great preacher. He's preaching tonight, I got saved. But he's always playing practical jokes on people. He and another preacher went to a big conference where there's thousands of people in the sanctuary. And uh, they were all standing there, and the guy beside him, like my dad, couldn't hear very well. And he said, what did that man say? He said, he called on you to pray. So the man started praying in front of thousands of people. But uh, John, tell Daddy to pray. Father, we bow
Thank you, Margaret. Now we're ready, Margaret. <laughs> we have a revival coming up in April. And in May, I'm sorry. And it's going to cost us some money. I'll go ahead and tell you. And um, we're going to ask people, you give your tithes and your offering, but if you feel the Lord leading you, we're going to ask you to give some money to pay before the revival comes. You got that many days or weeks. Now, revival cost, it costs money, it costs your time, it costs your prayers. There's a lot of cost. Either we pay the cost or we don't have revival. I mean, that's the way it goes. So this morning, I've already had somebody give me $500 toward the revival. My dad, he said, I want to have a revival. $500. Norm and I are giving $500. We need to raise $5,000. There's not, there's, there may be somebody sitting here right now and I'm going to give you a chance. Does anybody want to give $5,000 and I'll shut up? $5,000 and I'll shut up. Oh, several hands. <laughs> so, several hands going, I wish I had it. I'd give it. Somebody else this morning, we will promise between now and May 16th to give $500 toward the revival. Anybody? Anybody else? Is that one for both of y'all or is that one each? Well, one, two, three. That's 15. That's $2,500. We're halfway there. Amen. Don't let, this, don't let this cramp your spirit. Somebody go in there. Is that preacher asking for money? Well, you can't turn the TV on unless they're asking for money. Can't turn your phone on unless they're asking for money. Why shouldn't God's work also ask for money? Well, they know amen's right there, right? Hey, sing with me. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Find the glory, revive us. Uh. Keep playing, Margaret. We're halfway there. We're not quitting until we get it. Now, is anybody else, before we move on to the lower amounts, anybody else, $500 between now and May 16th? There's another one right there. We need, help me out, Norma. <laughs> Four more, 500. Anybody else want to give 500? <laughs> Anybody this morning, you say, I'll give $250 toward the revival. There's one back there. Norma, keep up with that. Anybody else? $250. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, there's five. All right. How many of you will give $100 between now and the revival toward the revival? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. How many of you give $25 between now and the revival? Raise your hand. How many of you give a dollar? Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> I said dollar and I saw one husband say, have we got that in the bank? Did you know we were just now raised $5,500? $5,500. Now what kind of benefits is that going to pay? That's going to finance our advertising. You say, oh, surely you're going to give those young preachers at least $10 a piece, aren't you? Are you kidding me? We're going to treat them like kings. We're going to give them two or $300 a piece after they preach. They're, you're going to see them sweating and praising. Them young preachers are going to say, honey, we ain't never got this much money. We want them to feel like they're pastoring First Baptist Church, Dallas, Texas. We've got groups, quality groups coming here. We're going to pay them for their services. Churches, and I'll say this in us, churches have reputations, don't they, Terry? Don't they, Dad? Reputations, Eddie, don't they? Of giving a little dollar here for a group, a dollar here for a preacher. We want our reputation to be, you go to West Hendersonville Baptist Church, they appreciate what God's people do. And that's the reputation we want to have. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah. God's people said, Amen. Amen. You talking about worship? You said, "When do we get to worship?" That was worship, right there. That was worship. Somewhere beyond the grave, there is a land that Jesus.
Jesus has gone to prepare by his own hands. And for those who are saved by grace, there is a resting place. And a few more days from now, it will be mine. Some call it heaven, I call it home. Some call it dreaming, well let me dream on. Some call it paradise, somewhere beyond the skies. Some call it heaven, I call it home. Someone said you can't go back home again. Things will not ever be as good as they've been. But I've got good news for you. When heaven comes into view, one glimpse and you'll know the best. Epo is yet to come. <laughs> Amen. Some call it heaven. Had to sing that song or Donnie wasn't going to come back. Last week he said, if you sing, I call it home, I'll come back. I go ahead. Oh, go right ahead. You're happy. Yeah, keep it going. And this is for Rock. Rock said, if you don't, if you sing that song, I'm leaving. <laughs> Amen, Apo. <laughs> Tempted.
mercy. <laughs> Mother, I love you. She can't come every Sunday. Dementia. Boy, it's a monster, isn't it? Some of you have had health problems. Some of you have had other situations. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Farther along, you're going to understand why. Farther along on that other shore, Benny, you're going to see your husband. Epo, he's there waiting for you. Those are the things that's going to happen. Mom, I love you. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but there's a little bit of glory going on right around it here. <laughs> Woo, sing it if you can. Farther. Come on, let's sing. We may just sing and shout the whole time. Some of y'all, some of y'all are full of God, and you're ready to get on with this thing. Y'all got can't have a revival now. It comes May. That's in May. This morning we're going to be preaching. Uh, this morning we'll be preaching on missions. And going, thinking about those folks that are on other parts of the world and in our neighborhood that are not saved. And so here's a song we'll sing right before I preach this morning entitled, My House is Full. my 
We could just say amen and go home, but don't say amen right there. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke. Good to have Luke with us. Diane's grandson is Luke. Turn to the book of Luke. And he wrote it, by the way. Luke wrote that. And this morning we're going to preach on compassion, compelled outreach. You remember about 10 years ago, it seems like, we started this message series on the church. The first Sunday we preached on the Christ-centered outcry. What does a church need? It needs a Christ-centered outcry, which is preaching. What else, what else does a church need? It needs a heart-connected outflow, which is fellowship. And Larry, I believe that, yeah, there it is, fellowship. And then the you in the word church, the church needs an unction channeled outbreak worship. That's what we had right here this morning, an unction channeled outbreak. Also, the church needs a redemption conquered outcome. That's discipleship. So that brings us to the letter C in the word church. And the church needs a compassion compelled outreach, which is missions. Now, next Sunday, Lord willing, We'll be preaching on the letter H and finishing this sermon series. The church needs a heaven-cherished outlook of victory. You need to come next week. We're going to be in the heavens next week. It's going to be great. But this morning in the book of Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse 16, we'll bring you this thought to you this morning. The Bible says, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. And sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first one said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray they have me excused. The other Baptist, I'm sorry, the other one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another, another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Now, that guy there is the only one that has a reasonable excuse. You do, listen, you do not go buy a piece of land and you've never seen it. That's what the first guy said. You don't go buy an ox or a cow or a cattle and never prove them. This guy just come right out and gave the, he's the only one that told the truth. He says, I've married a woman and I can't come. That's the end of that. Can't do it. Uh, don't use that excuse during the revival. Verse 21. So the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there's still room. Verse 23. You know I've turned into a one-verse preacher. We're going to be on 23 and not leave 23. And the Lord said unto his servant, Go out in the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of these men which bidden shall taste of my supper. Lord, today we ask you, God, you're calling all of us right now, Lord, in this message. You're calling each one of us, God, to be missionaries. You tell us in your word that we're sent, that we're missionaries, that we have the gospel. But God, we're responsible for not only Hendersonville, Henderson County, North Carolina, the United States. We're responsible for those around the world. God, we just ask you, you'd burden our hearts today and help us to, to listen and to understand what you have to say to us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. The church needs a compassion compelled outreach. A church without a compassion compelled outreach becomes a dead church. You might as well write over the front door of West Hendersonville Baptist Church, Ichabod. You might as well write over the front door of West Hendersonville Baptist Church, the Dead Sea. If you're not going to reach out 
and look for lost and dying souls all around the world. The greatest news we can have, Evie, is somebody coming down the aisle like you did two weeks ago and giving their heart to Jesus. Our job is to get new converts, to get people into the kingdom of God before Jesus comes again. And we must have a compassion compelled. Why? Because Jesus in the New Testament, read it for yourself, was filled with compassion. Anytime he turned around and there was a group of people, even one person, Jesus' heart was filled with compassion because he wanted to see people come to Christ. Notice, first of all, the Great Commission. Look in verse 23. Go out in the highways and the hedges. You see, the command is clear. It's the word go. You see in that verse, go. The word go is our command. In Mark, the Bible says, and he said unto them, Jesus telling the people and the disciples, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go, that's our command. In Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. Notice that verse, very important for the local church. We're to be missionaries. We should be getting the gospel out to all these places at the same time. The Bible says we're to focus locally like Jerusalem. We're to focus regionally like Judea. We're to focus nationally like Samaria. We're to focus internationally like the uttermost parts of the world. The command is clear. Here's something else in that verse. Remember we're in verse 23. The course is clear. Go out into the highways. He's given us a destination. He says the course is clear. Hey, every day they pass me by. I can see it in their eyes. You can too. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. Only they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides the silent cries. Only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When we realize that people needs the Lord. Hey, we have the great commission. The command is clear, go. The course is clear into the highways. The cost is clear. Look what it says. Go in the highways and hedges. Hedges, what are the hedges? Highways are the people we see every day, the ones we rub elbows with, the ones we pass in different places. Hedges are those that we have to get off the road to go find. We have to go down to the trailer park, the poor area. We have to go to those who perhaps don't meet in our social standard. We got to find those perhaps that might need a bath, somebody who is uneducated. We have to go find these people into the highways and in the hedges. It costs money, it costs time, it costs sacrifice. I heard the story, I'll give it to you. A missionary in Africa was once asked if he really liked what he was doing. His response was shocking. Here's what he said. Do I like this work, he said? No, my wife and I do not like dirt. We have reasonable, refined sensibilities. We do not like crawling into vile huts through goat refuse. But is a man to do nothing for Christ he does not like? God pity him if he not. Liking or disliking has nothing to do with it. We have orders to go and we go because love constrains us. It's the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Look in verse number 23. Here's the grave compelling. The grave compelling. It says unto them, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Compel them. The great compelling. What is that? What is compelling? Compelling is begging. Compelling is an urgency. Compelling is I've got to get you to Christ. You see, there's a sense of necessity to our message. There's a sense of necessity. There's a sense of urgency to our message. Miriam Webster says that compel means to drive or urge forcefully or irresistibly, to cause to do or occur by overwhelming pressure. How would you plead? How would you plead if your house was on fire and the only person inside was your small child? How would you plead if they were in there? What would you do? 
Would you casually go in your car and hope the fire department shows up? What would you do to get that child out of that house? That's compelling. Compelling is having an urgent desire to pull somebody from the flames and to set them free. That's what compelling is. Paul says, and knowing this, that the, now is high time to wake out of sleep. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Listen, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. When lately have you sat down and every time your heart beat, realizing that every 1.8 seconds a human being dies. You're sitting there watching the game, and go ahead, I do too. You'll watch the Masters this afternoon. Pretty good. It's looking interesting. And you'll be enjoying You'll be laughing. Bring me another drink. Give me some more chips. Give me a, let's go ride in my new car. Let's get our new clothes on. Let's do all of this. Every 1.8 seconds, death. 1.8 seconds, death. They're falling around. What are we to do? We have an urgent command. We have a, a compelling here to get out and to find these people. Matthew says, and when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. And he said unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of harvest that he will send forth the laborers into his harvest. Say not then you have four months and then come as harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they're white already to harvest. There's a sense of necessity and urgency to our message. There's a sense of need to the mission. Look what it says. Compel them. Compel them. Look at their particular situation. Who are we trying to reach? Who are we trying to tell about the gospel? It's about them. We have to concentrate our efforts on them. There's a sense of need to the mission. And then there's a sense of neighbor to the method. The Lord says in the book here, and compel them to what? Come in. To compel them to come in. Why do you compel them? To come in and be part of us. Come in and enjoy the service we had this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. It's still going on up here. I'm trying to fan it. It's still going on. You find a little flame, you want to keep it going. There's a sense of neighbor. Who is our neighbor? Jesus, the disciples, would you believe that? The disciples, that's Jesus. Imagine you're walking with Jesus, right? You're a disciple. And Jesus is talking about neighbors, and you just said, uh, can I have a question here? Who is my neighbor? Yeah. You better not ask Jesus a question. He'll give you the answer. And you may not like the answer. Jesus said a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And a certain priest came and passed by on the other side. And a certain Levite came by and passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And he saw him and he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds and pouring in oil and wine. And set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Jesus said, there's your neighbor. Your neighbor, he's the one that needs help. He's the one that's fallen Oh, I'm going out. Jerry, I believe I found somebody that would fit in West Hendersonville real good. They got a little money. They got a nice car. I play golf with them. Boy, they're nice people. We'll take them. Sure, we'll take them. But I'm waiting for somebody to say, hey, Jerry, I found this old derelict down on 7th Avenue. Boy, he don't smell so good. And, you know, I talked to him about Jesus and he got gloriously saved. Is it all if he comes in? Come right on in. Come right on in. You say, what's our job? Love him. Nourish him. Encourage him. Bless him. Praise him. Get him going. Get him cranked up. God may send him to Africa. God may send him to some country around the world. And he will probably be the one to say, wherever he wants me to go, whatever he wants me to do, Jerry, I'm willing to do it. We need laborers in the field. There's a great commission there's a grave compelling in verse 23. But lastly, there's a gracious compassion. Look what it says. That my house may be filled. How do we fill God's house? How do you fill up God's house? By the way, it's starting to fill up. This is nice. Just keep filling up. How do you fill up God's house? There's peace and contentment in my father's house today. We sang a while ago. Lots of food on the table. No one to turn away. They're singing and laughter and praising as hours pass by. But a hush comes to singing as the father sadly cries. My house is full. My field 
is empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems my children all want to stay around my table, but no one wants to work in my field. Hey, I enjoy this. Are you ready? I enjoy staying around God's table. I enjoy what happened this morning. Jerry, I feel so sorry for you. Don't feel sorry for me. God just, I don't know why he did it, but he did. He just opened up a bottle, dying, and just poured his Holy Spirit on me. Man, it was so wonderful. But all those tears, weren't you just sad? No, I wasn't sad. I was excited. I was happy. I was enjoying God. I enjoy that, but wait. We get filled up and we get enjoying this stuff. We can't keep this to ourselves. We can't keep this to ourselves. We got the blessings of God. Out here are thousands in Henderson County who this morning are waking up with a headache from their big party last night. They can't find peace or joy. They're going to die and go to a devil's hell if they don't live long enough to meet God. And you and I are missionaries, and our job is to get out into the field and work for our master. Now, that's not an easy message, but that's a fact from God's word. Next time you get out and you get out at the shell station or wherever, you put that thing in there. Psh, go ahead and put it on automatic and step around the pump. There she is, a mother, single mother with three kids in the car. Boy, she's worked all day. She's had it up to here with children. She can't stand it. She, if she could just escape the whole situation. She don't know how in the world she's going to get the next bill paid. She don't know how in the world she'll have peace in the middle of the night holding that little sick baby in her arms. And you've got the answer to her problem. And you just stand around and say, ma'am, do you know Jesus is your savior? You say, I can't do that. That would be embarrassing. Hey, get away from the table. Go out in the field and tell others what God has done in you. we got to see the world as sinners. We have to see them as sinners. In Psalms it says, but thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious and long-suffering, plenteous in mercy and truth. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. What did Paul say? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul added this little phrase, of whom I am chief. I'm the chief of sinners, Paul said. We must see the world as sinners. We must see the world as souls. The Bible says in Psalms, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. We have to sow tears over these people. In our own carnal self, in our own worldly desires, we don't see a need to tell somebody about Christ. In a minute, we'll say our final amen. We'll all go out. I hope I get to shake everybody's hand and hug you next. I love doing that. Norma does too. And we just say bye to you again. Do we go home and we take this book when we get home and say, see you next week. And then we just forget. We just forget about people dying on the other side of the world. In China, billions of people, who's going to tell them about Christ? Robbie Mullinax will. I'm not kin to him, but I tell people I am. Robbie Mullinax is a missionary to China. He sneaks in the Word of God. They get hundreds of thousands of copies and sneak them in. And they try to get them over here to these underground churches without getting caught. If they get caught, you won't see them again. That's the kind of punishment they have. We have what you call freedom of religion. In America, we can do what we want to. We, you probably got seven or ten of these copies if you really dug down deep in your closet. I bet there's ten or fifteen of these in here. And yet we just see you next week. We've got to get on fire for God. We've got to have a revival so that our hearts are melted. Our hearts must be melted for those out there. Come to this, first thing you do, come to the altar and you say this right here. God, break my heart for the lost people. Don't let me see them as just a person. Don't let me see them as somebody I think is not socially acceptable, dirty, filthy, or perhaps misdirected. Help me to see them as a sinner, as a soul that's going to hell, that can meet Jesus. Give me that vision. The Bible says, the one song says, O soul, are you weary and troubled? Soul. No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for the look at the Savior and life more abundant. 
and free. Sing with me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. We've got to see the world as sinners. We have to see the world as saints, but lastly, we have to see the world as saints. I should have said saints. Now, therefore, you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. When you look at the sinner realizing he has a soul, you have to envision him as a saint. If we had time and I went around and pointed to you, and you told me how you became a Christian and why you're here. You would not believe the stories that's involved in where you used to be. If I could snap my fingers and I wouldn't do it and flash all of us back to the moments before we were saved. I would tell Norma, get the grandkids, my parents, leave John, but get the rest of them and let's get out of here. I wouldn't be safe to be in the building. Come on. I wouldn't be safe to be in the building with you before you were saved. Not all of us. You were thinking about yourself. You were thinking about sin. You didn't think about God. You had all those. You'd be looking around. If I snapped my finger, you'd look around. First of all, what am I doing here? Let's go. Let's go grab us a drink. Come on, we're going over to the bar. Let's go over here. They're playing cards. We can win some money. We can get my friends. We can curse. We can blaspheme. But somehow God reached your heart and converted you and brought you in and took your soul and made a saint out of you. Yeah, you're looking at St. Jerry. That's right. You all thought all these people in these stained glasses were the only one saint. If you're saved, you're a saint of God. We have to see the world as saints. What kind of, what kind of potential do they have? Let me close with this. Now, what's your excuse? What's your excuse? Are you going to tell people about Jesus? You invite them to church? You say, I can't really tell somebody about Jesus. I think I'm scared. Can you invite them to church? Can you give them one of our brochures, one of our newsletters, one of our bulletins? Can you do that and say, hey, just come visit? Because if you get them under the sound of the gospel, perhaps they'll be convicted and find the Savior. You could do that. But what is your excuse? Why do you not do that? Is it your property? We just read it. And they, with all consent, began to make excuse. The first one said, I bought a piece of ground. I must needs go say it. I pray you have me excuse. Do you put more into your possessions? Do you think your possessions are more important to you than somebody's lost and dying soul? Is it your property or is it your possessions? Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. I pray you have me excused. I met a, had a guy in my church. He said, and he said, I just bought a camper. Went, oh, no, no. Why did you do that? Oh, no, no. There he goes. He's gone. <laughs> it's all right to have a camper. But I knew what that meant to him. 52 Sundays a year. He's probably going to go camping, 35 of them. And he's not going to think of church. He's going to get out there. And it's good to go camping. There's a lot of times to go camping. We are, whenever we go on vacations or camping, we come back on Saturday so we can go to church on Sunday. But he got this camper. I went, oh, law. His possessions. Now he's going to think more of his possessions than he does about the lost and dying people around the world. What excuse do you have? Are you going to be like this? Your passions. When you say, and another man said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. What is going to be your excuse did you know that Jesus said that we're all without excuse? Not this morning when about five minutes from now we're walking out and going to get something to eat. Not that kind of feeling. The feeling when we stand before God. We stand behind a God. Did you, notice what the, did you notice what the master in this story did? He became angry. He became angry with these excuses. He said, okay, then if they won't do it, go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. What's your excuse? What do you do then? Here you go. This morning, open up your heart to God and say, God, whatever you want me to do. Lord, I'm nervous about it. I'm, I don't know if I can, but if I meet somebody, I'm either going to say, come to church next Sunday, or I'm going to say, do you know Jesus as your savior? What is your excuse? A church needs a compassion-compelled outreach missions. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. He, in this verse, he gives us the great commission, the grave compelling, and the gracious compassion. This morning for the invitation, going to be a little bit different. I didn't even tell 
Terry or Margaret, because I didn't think I was going to do this. But I wrote a song years ago, and it's entitled, Come On Over Into Macedonia and Help Us. I rarely sing it, because I just don't feel comfortable singing it. I think somebody else should be singing it. But I'm going to sing it for the invitation this morning. It's over in the book of Acts, where the people on the mission field, those dying without Christ, said, Come on over into Macedonia and help us. There's some place, there's some place in a foreign country, there's some place in Hendersonville, in Washington State, in Oregon, there's some place out there, perhaps somebody this morning, God is, you can hear their voices. Listen, listen to the voices. Come on over into Macedonia and help us. Some of y'all remember that horrible tragedy that happened years ago. I think it was in New Jersey, but I'm not really certain about that. It was a bar. They were having a concert in a small bar nightclub. There's about 200 people in there. This band decided they would do something fancy, that they would actually have fireworks go off in there. They're behind them and make it look better when they're singing, you know. So they're up there jamming. The, the room is full of smoke. The people are drunk. The people are on drugs. Boy, they're, they're right there where they got to be to try to satisfy that hungry heart. And those fireworks in that old building that really shouldn't have had any kind of fire in it. And all of a sudden it caught the stage on fire. And then it caught the building on fire. And you remember hearing the stories that it suddenly filled the building with smoke and all the people ran to only one exit that was open in that building. And here you know what happened. I don't have to tell you. They began to run over each other. And at the door they were stacked like stove wood. Fifteen or twenty in this door just like this laying. Fifteen or twenty in this. And the rest of the people trying to get past that. And that night, 200 people perished at a party where they were looking for happiness and looking for joy. That's what we got to hear. That's the voice you got to hear. You say, I can't listen to that. I can't listen to voices screaming, saying, get me out of this fire. Help me, help me. That's what God wants us to hear. Oh, I love this right here. Farther along, I call it heaven. Hallelujah, let's have a good time. When they come in here, we want to have a good time. But we've got to listen to their cries. We've got to realize they're out there. We've got to say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm without excuse. If it means giving up my possessions, oh boy, I don't know if we should go there. If it means giving up the things I love the most, if it means giving up my time, God, help me to go out there and to find those who need you. The Savior has come in His mighty power and spoken peace to my soul.